So again, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Philip Drum. I'm a pharmacist. Been around for a few years. Um, I just wanted to give you my uh, my disclosure statement. I have no financial interest in the marijuana industry. Um, I'm doing this actually on a voluntary basis. Um, I'm taking a day off of work um, uh, to, to come up here and, and educate you all. And I want to thank the group for, for inviting me, so thank you very much. Again, I think we're all seeing this information coming out. And I think people are concerned. Um, it's being reported through the media multiple times now that we're seeing increases in auto crashes and there, there, there seem to be some relationship with marijuana presence or THC presence. Again, I, I may be slipping back and forth too as well, so again, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so again, it's no secret. So just to give you a quick overview of what I'm gonna be talking about today, um, as a pharmacist, again, I'm very engaged in pharmacology. I was the guy that was sitting at home or in the library looking over structures and being able to draw them and, and show how things get metabolized. Um, so we'll go over that a little bit. Um, we'll talk about some driving law issues that are out there that some people, um, I wanna share with you what I'm seeing in the laws um, that don't seem to be represented well um, when they're spoken of. Um, I'm gonna talk about some monitoring issues, some fatal crash data that I have um, that I've done some research with. And I also want to uh, talk about cost versus revenue and then have some conclusions here at the end. First question for you. Do these drugs appear similar? Raise your hand if you think these drugs appear similar. A two carbon chain molecule, which is ethanol or alcohol, which is water soluble. And then our other product, Delta 9 THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, which is fat soluble. Again, Key question, where's our largest fat organ in the body? It's right between our ears, okay? And so here, um, very readily in the water, but what about that Delta 9 THC? Okay, so quickly about cannabinoids, the mechanism of action. Again, the reality is, is there's no human cannabinoids. There's a nandamide um, is the neurochemical. Um, again, the way we discovered this we, we knew about cannabis, we knew about Delta 9 THC. Um, we also knew about them, we found the receptor sites. So we called them cannabinoid receptor sites because we knew that, that those cannabinoids were hitting a receptor site. So we called them CD1, CD2. Um, but then we found anandamide, the natural neurochemical that's, that's in the body. Um, we haven't gone back on the muscle. Uh, the Delta 9 THC half-life is anywhere between 1.6 to 4 hours. It gets metabolized, a couple of major metabolites. There are some that are psychoactive, uh, just to warn you. Um, when I talk, I tend to talk fast, sorry. Um, but I also um, have had people tell me that it's like trying to sip water from a fire hose um, with, my, with how much information I tend to give, so try to slow down. Um, so hydroxy delta, hydroxy THC is more psychoactive actually than even the parent compound. And then we have carboxy THC which is another major metabolite that does stick around in the body. We see it for a long period of time. One of the key issues, though, is that Delta 9 THC does leave the bloodstream quite quickly. Okay, so studies that have come out at the National Institute of Health are showing about 73% of Delta 9 THC is gone within 30 minutes. And about 90% of Delta 9 THC is gone within 1.4 hours. 90% is gone in 1.4 hours. So that's concerning. Um, that our, our psychoactive component, THC, is disappearing from the blood, but it's not disappearing from the body. As I've already mentioned, it's going into the brain. That's where it's residing. And slowly then it comes back out, gets into the bloodstream, gets metabolized into, into hydroxy, which is even more psychoactive than the parent compound, and it can also get converted also into carboxy as well. Okay, side effects. Side effects, especially those that, that may impair somebody's ability to drive that we see with these cannabinoids, slow reaction time, increased heart rate and blood pressure, which is objective measures. We also see lack of convergence, we see eyelid tremors, we see dry mouth, anxiety with chronic use. Just a warning, we have heard it from our, our speakers before, um, that there are some warnings that are required in our state here in California, but there's also warnings on our FDA approved cannabinoids as well about driving. Okay, so we do have warnings on dronabinol, the cannabinoid that was approved by the Food and Drug Administration, which is actually Delta 9 THC, that was approved back in 1985, people. 
So we've had Delta 9 THC FDA approved since 1985. And in that warning, there's, there's a section in the package insert that does warn you that this, this product, you should not be driving again as a pharmacist. I have to put that little sticker on there saying, do not drive, okay? Do not operate heavy machinery or drive, okay? Um, the, the newer drug that was just recently approved here in June was cannabidiol or CBD, Epidiolex. And again, also in that package insert, they warn you to not drive, okay? And then again, just to mention, in our own California medical marijuana bill, there was also the stipulation that we had to put um, the warning, and we heard this um, in our previous talk, that we do have to put the warning about driving on, on medical cannabis as well. Okay, that's a requirement by state law. Okay, Dr. Igor Grant showed this yesterday. And so this is a very important slide because again, this is reiterating what I was just talking about, how quickly Delta 9 THC leaves the body. So again, he showed you this yesterday. So this is inhaled marijuana, and this is oral marijuana. And so what this is, is this is a time on the bottom curve, and then up here is our plasma levels. So as you can see, following a, a smoke version of, of marijuana, um, that we see this very rapid level getting up to about 150 nanograms per ml, okay, and then it drops very quickly, as I just mentioned. It drops very quickly, okay? So we see how quickly it drops, and it slowly comes out. So here's one hour, here's two hours, three hours, four hours. And right here, as I'm pointing out, is two hours, and I'm gonna show you why that's very important. But look at what the levels are at two. Okay, so the levels are quite low here. Again, that lowest level is around 10. So we're under that 10 value right here, easily at two hours, easily. Okay, you can see it, so even over here, we we're, were below 10 within an hour, okay? After reaching a peak of 150. The other ones are the metabolites. So again, these things are, are showing up. Again, this is blood uh, following inhale. We can also see then there's the difference over here when it's oral because what's happening is that oral dose is getting metabolized in the liver the first place it's going. So that's why we're seeing the metabolites then in much higher levels. Um, we see a huge amount then of the carboxy THD, which is psychoinactive. Um, but we see a much larger amount of the hydroxy value, which is psychoactive. Again, even more psychoactive than that parent compound. We see the parent compound values, though, are lower, but we also see it stretched out because, again, this time period is now two, four, six, eight hours, okay? And one other thing to point out, it's very difficult then for us to be able to back extrapolate what that THC level was. That's not true for alcohol. Alcohol, we can back extrapolate a value with the blood levels drawn later because, because alcohol undergoes a standard zero order elimination, meaning it's gonna eliminate at the same rate that obviously is not eliminating at the same rate that THC. Alcohol does. And so with alcohol, then we can back up and figure out, okay, it's two hours later. So what the estimate is for every one hour that you delay drawing blood, you lose 0 0.015. And so if you lost, if it's been two hours since driving, it's 0 0.015 times two, and you add that now to whatever your blood level is to get what the actual level was at the time of driving. You cannot do that with THC. Here's that study that I talked to you about. It's a study that I, I co-authored, which looked at vehicular assaults and vehicular homicides in the state of Colorado. This was prior to McNeely, this was in 2012. Okay, this is prior to their legalization. That we were looking then at vehicular homicides and vehicular assaults, and we were just looking to see how long it took for blood to be drawn, whether it be an assault or a homicide. And the reason why we went after those was because there tends to be more mayhem and it tends to take a longer period of time to get blood drawn. And what we found then, there were differences, there was a slight difference, but there was, the p-value did not reach statistical significance, but on average, the median time was two hours to draw blood. Two hours to draw blood, okay? We also looked at the difference between the state patrol versus the local PD. There was a statistically significant difference in time. It was 2.9 hours for the state patrol, or for the local PD, it was 1.9 hours. Okay, so it's taken an additional hour for the state police. Well, the state police go out into the rural areas, and it takes longer to get those patients back in, was our supposition as to what was going on there. Okay, so let's quickly talk about the simulated driving evaluation of, of a study that looked at alcohol and uh, marijuana, and they also looked at the combination. So this is a study that came out then um, through the National Institute of Health. Rebecca Hartman was the lead author. This is Marilyn Hughes, this is lab. 
And so what this study shows, they were looking at an, um, the driving then an infrequent cannabis user. So we're talking about one time every three months, but less than three times a week. So an infrequent user. When what they were looking at then was they were, at, they were giving them alcohol and they were seeing how they were driving. They then tested those exact same drivers with giving them some cannabis. And the amount of cannabis that they were using was 500 milligrams of a low dose, which was 2.9% THC. Who sells that? Okay, we also were used, they also used 6.7% THC. Who sells that? Okay, and then the reason why they had to do that was that was the lab, you know, that they could get the cannabis from, because again, this is a federal study, they're getting it out of the Mississippi lab, and that's the natural THC that they can generate down there. We don't have that in our states. We have much, much, much higher concentrations. Okay, so this was a fairly low and even lower dose of THC, and what did they see? Well. Here's what they saw. Again, they, they were looking at that standard deviation of lateral positioning, AKA weaving, and they were looking at the amount of weaving and they equated the blood alcohol concentration of 0.08, which is federally mandated and it's all, in all states, that that was a level of 13.1 of THC. Here's the key point. They had a catheter in the person's arm. That was at the time of driving. Okay? And they also looked at 0.05, I know Utah, anybody from Utah, um, they're starting to look at now 0.05 of their blood alcohol, and that was equivalent to 8.2 nanograms per ml of THC, okay? And so again, at the time of driving, they were drawing the blood as they were weaving down the road. Okay, getting too loud. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry, I'm a big talker. <laughs> and so um, our Delta 9 THC levels then, um, 1.4 hours, again, dependent on what the concentration is, uh, we saw 3.7 1.4 hours later, and we saw 4.6. So these values, that 13.1, they're dropping, okay? So after 1.4 hours, it was 3.7. 2.3 hours later, it was 1.9, okay? And so here we are at 6.7% THC. 1.4 hours later, it was for now 4.6. Remember what I told you how long it takes to draw blood? Two hours which is in between here is how long it's taking. And so then we saw, I'll take questions at the end if I can. Um, it was 2.6, okay? The other issue was the blood alcohol um, with, combined with THC. So we have 0 0.05 plus five nanograms of THC it was creating that same amount of standard deviation of lateral positioning. So a lower dose of alcohol and a much lower dose of THC created that same amount. So this is the concerning part. Now you've added the two together, two central nervous system depressants that are now having this impairment effect on driving. So this is where I love to raise the question. We have a 0 0.08 for alcohol. What's the, blood, what's the alcohol level when you combine alcohol with the benzodiazepine? What should be the alcohol level if you add alcohol, a benzodiazepine, and marijuana? What should be the alcohol level if you have methamphetamine and, and benzodiazepine? and marijuana, get it? The level, the, the value starts dropping of alcohol to cause the impairment because you have other CNS drugs on board. So it's not 0 0.08 when you have three or four drugs in there. It's a much lower alcohol level. So let's look at some, some of these driving uh, studies that are out there. Again, this study was looking at 2.9 versus 6%. Um, I'm aware of another study going on that's 5.9 versus 13%. Well, the key question is, what's the percent of flower that we're using out there? Well, here's, here's the state of Washington. Their average is 21, 22%. These people are studying at 13%, not what's being sold. Here's the extract for inhalation, okay? So these are your e-cigarettes, okay? Your butane hash oil concentrations, which are around 70%. Are they even doing study with BHL in driving simulators? Okay, so these are types of questions that we need to ask. We also need to, again, as Lauren said, we have to be careful about trying to consider these, these values of uh, these types of studies being real, real life, okay? Because these people are sitting in their own, they know they're being monitored. So guess what, you think they're speeding? They know they're being monitored. And I'll show you what they're actually doing in real life, okay? We need to make sure that there is some crossover um, in the studies, that if you're not doing crossover studies, it's kind of a failure. Um, chronicity of THC use needs to be determined as well because I know that there's some concern over can somebody gain tolerance. Okay, so let's look at some of these actual driving laws that are out there as well that tend to get misquoted. 
This one's the one that I, that I get concerned about the most, is the state of Washington. People will sit there and tell me that the level is five nanograms per ml of alcohol. And I say, yes, and if drawn within two hours. This is the law, this is what it says. So it says the person has within two hours of driving a THC level of five or higher. That's the per se law. Within two hours, why do you think they pick two hours? Remember what I showed you, what happens to the blood level over time. They go on to section 4B and talk about samples obtained more than two hours can be anything above 0.00, may be used as evidence that a person was under the influence or affected by marijuana in violation of the subsection of above. Now is that five nanograms? If drawn after two hours, two hours and one minute, anything above zero could be deemed impaired. That's their law, that's what it says. Here's McNeely, another law that tends to be misquoted as well. This, this represent, this is, these are the exact words used by Justice Sotomayor in the majority decision. She says, this is a case in which a person was driving down the road in Missouri, okay? The officer pulled him over, failed his field sobriety test, brought him in, and he said, okay, we're gonna draw blood. He said no. The officer then took his blood anyway. Made it all the way up to the Supreme Court and was deemed a violation of his Fourth Amendment right. Okay, and the reason why was because he said no. And here was the key issue though. They said, the question presented here is whether the natural metabolization of alcohol, remember what I told you about alcohol, we can back extrapolate alcohol. There was no need to get his blood without his consent. They could have gotten a warrant for that illegal search and seizure and drawn his blood and we could have back extrapolated it. That's what this case is about, because it talks about, again, a case in, in, involving non-consensual blood draw in all drunk driving cases. We conclude that it does not be hold consistent with the Fourth Amendment principles that exigency in the context must be determined on a case by case basis based on the totality of the circumstances. So note that this is only for alcohol. This is only addressing the blood's being drawn without consent. So if you're drawing the blood and they consented, you can draw their blood without, with their consent. You can enter a house if they consent, right, officers? You don't have to get a warrant, okay? So if they say, go ahead and draw my blood, you do not need a warrant. McNeely does not say that, okay? If exigency exists, there's no need for a warrant because they told you right here. And exigency exists in all marijuana cases due to the rapid elimination of THC. I showed you that, okay? Here's why people are now starting to see this. Okay, so people are, this is an oral swab for zero tolerance in Scotland. Um, it may start October 21st of this year. People now are starting to recognize this now. And they're starting to adopt oral swabs with zero tolerance. And we'll be talking about that. Okay, so blood THC levels are a good measure of a high sensation. Raise your hand if you believe that. Are blood levels a good measure of a high sensation? Mean, Nobody. Do you mean uh, blood, blood THC levels are a good measure of whether or not someone feels Correct. Okay, well this, this kind of answers. This study, again, this is an older study um, that was done back in uh, 1981 in which they were giving uh, somebody an oral um, cannabis 15 milligrams of THC and they were, they were uh, so this, this curve on the bottom is the plasma concentration going from zero up to six. Okay, so they gave them 15 milligrams of THC. This is showing that subjective high on a scale of, one, of zero to five, okay? And these are then the, the elements at, at the various times as to where they, they resided. So what I would like to show you here is at 30 minutes, we see the exact same blood value that we see at three hours. Now, let's look at what was the level of subjective high at 30 minutes. Well, it was one out of five or 20% of maximum. What was the level of high at three hours? It was four and a half about, or 90% of maximum. Is that subjective high the same? Clearly way different with the exact same blood level. This is the high sen uh, sensation after IV inhaled or oral marijuana. Again, there is an IV uh, formulation. Again, these are old studies that were done back in 1981 and 80. Um, that we're looking at, um, you know, what, what, what was the high sensation? So this was done on the scale of zero to, zero to 10. Across the bottom is the time after administration. So what we can see here is, again, the intravenous is five, five milligrams. Again, the peak effect is very quick. 
for smoked, fairly quick. And then for oral, it takes a while to start maximizing out that high sensation. Okay? Two to three hours later, and we've been hearing about that, right? The oral takes a while because it has to get into your body. It's got to go through your liver. Then it's slowly accumulating in the brain over time. Okay. So law enforcement officers cannot detect marijuana presence and or impairment. Who believes that statement? Law officers cannot detect marijuana. Everybody knows this now. Everybody knows that law officers down then can. So I think I could put, slip back, pass this really fast. DRE uh, characteristics, this was a study uh, that came out, um, again, out of um, Rebecca Hartman, National Institute of Health, um, looked at 302 toxicologically confirmed with the THC value greater than one um, that was successfully identified by a DRE officer. So again, drug recognition expert, they're, ex they're specially trained uh, officers um, in, in identifying detection. And what they found for all performance characteristics to be above 96.7% prediction of cannabis impairment needed to identify failure in two or more of the following standard field sobriety tests. These aren't random tests, these are standard performed field sobriety tests. And so what they were looking for then was have three or more failures in the finger to nose, eyelid tremors during a modified Lombard balance, two or more one-legged stand clues, or two or more walk and turn clues. Now they looked at other issues, the other common symptoms that they found of clinical significance were an increased heart rate, increased uh, systolic blood pressure, dilated pupil size, but other common symptoms that did not reach clinical significance also included um, rebound dilatation as well as lack of convergence. Okay? This is a study that looked um, down in Orange County, California here, just a few, few miles down the road. They looked at, um, uh, from 2010 to 2012, they were looking at THC concentration in drivers, and they were examining driving and the field sobriety test performance. They were looking at over 5,000 reports, and um, the standard field sobriety tests, their conclusions were the standard field sobriety tests were sensitive to impairment by marijuana, just like what I showed you. This is basically a reiteration of that previous study. Um, that other study also had, again, 300, 300 in the um, THC arm, and they had 300 in a control arm that they were comparing to to figure that out. So this now has 5,000 drivers. Standard field sobriety tests were effective. No correlation between the performance of the standard field sobriety test and the concentration of THC. No correlation, okay? And driving behaviors were similar between marijuana and alcohol impairment. That weaving, okay? So we should test for marijuana driving impairment for only two to three hours after consumption. Who believes that we should only test for two to three hours? Raise your hand. Nobody. Okay, great, you're in agreement. We shouldn't test just for two, two to three hours. Because here's a report on, out of monitoring health concerns related to marijuana from Colorado in 2016 where they convened a pile of experts and they came down with these, these decisions here. Time to wait before driving. We found substantial evidence that delaying driving for at least six hours after smoking less than 18 milligrams of THC allows the THC induced impairment to resolve or nearly resolve for users who use less than weekly. So infrequent users, it's six hours if you consume 18 milligrams. Okay? And if it was an edible, same amount, 18 milligrams, they said eight hours. And again, this is all referenced. I would refer you to go back to that reference there. there all the references are on there as to where they came to that conclusion. Okay? So I think you're asking the question, what's 18 milligrams? Right? Okay, so here we go. So if, you have a, if, if a joint is half a gram, and you have 12 or 23% THC. So again, the typical joint then has 60 to 115 milligrams of THC. There you go. So what that means is you and 2.3 of your best friends each consume 1.3 1, 1. 3, 3 of that 12% uh, THC for you to get 18 milligrams. You and 2.3 of your best friends are consuming that joint. Three of you to consume that 12% THC. Which again, are they selling that? I think they're getting closer to the 23%. And for you to get 18 milligrams, that's 5.4 of your best friends. So a total of six of you need to consume that joint for you to acquire 18 milligrams. Let's look at some of the edibles. You were hearing about them, but you weren't hearing about. You heard that the daily dose was, was or the uh, serving size was 10 milligrams. Do you realize that, when, when, from Dronabinol or Marinol, that is the maximum approved FDA dose size, 10 milligrams? They come as 2.5s, 5s, and 10 milligrams, okay? 
So they're calling that the standard serving size. They're allowing 100 milligrams to be in a package, so you could down all 100 milligrams worth at one time if you want. Again, we're talking about 18 milligrams, so that's 1.8 gummy bears, if you're using gummy bears, or a gummy bear and a gummy bear without its head. You're at 18 milligrams, okay? <laughs> How about the dang grasshopper bar? That's 420 milligrams of THC. Well, you better have 1 23rd of that bar because you're gonna be tipping your 18 milligrams, okay? Cookies, we know, 80 milligrams, so you better have a quarter of a cookie. Who eats a quarter of a cookie in this room? Please raise your hand. I lost 80 pounds recently, so I might try to eat a little bit less than the whole cookie, but I don't think I could even get away with a quarter of a, of a cookie. So anything more than a quarter of a cookie, you're over 18 milligrams. Got it? And again, they're in drinks as well. Okay, so chronic marijuana users drive better than intermittent users. Raise your hand if you believe that. Nobody. Great. Okay. So again, there are multiple studies out here that have looked at this, and they've seen that there's memory is impacted for 12 hours after abstinence and chronic users. They see that the concept formation and planning and sequencing of, of is impaired. Um, these are old studies. These are studies from 2002 that I'm referencing, 2011 that I'm referencing. Again, I'll refer you back to my slides to see all these. Again, decision-making and risk-taking is, is still seen after 25 days of abstinence. We see significant attention and concentration deficits in four weeks to two years following abstinence. We see slower information processing. You have to step on the brake real fast. These studies are old, 2004, 2011, 2002, okay? So again, we're seeing brain, brain changes with PET scans and things. We're seeing shrinking of the brain, right? So I would question whether we would actually see tolerance and somebody that, that has been a chronic user. Okay, so what tests are available in the blood? Well, again, um, I, I like to bring up the U.S. Department of Transportation has recommendations, okay? And what's the recommendation for all drugs? It's a urine test. Alcohol is the only one in which they will allow alcohol to be a breath or saliva test, blood test as well, okay? So again, the bottom line, this is, I took this from the, the regulations, the federal government, okay? Who, who are they concerned about? Well, they're concerned about interstate truck drivers and school bus drivers. And then also boat captains and pilots and, pilot and, and plane mechanics. They don't want those people having THC in their bodies. And so they are testing, uh, the drugs that are being tested then by, by them are listed here, marijuana, cocaine, amphetamines, PCP, opiates, and alcohol, okay? And the required testing for all other drugs is urine. It's not blood. They know not to look for blood for drugs, okay? So they're looking for urine and they're looking actually for metabolites, okay? 15 nanograms is an initial and a confirmatory test looking at 15 nanograms per ml in the urine. But it shows up in the urine, right? That's what everybody wants to tell me. And I'm saying, yeah, it did. It did. And look at this study that came out recently. This was in 2018, this came from Italy in which they were looking at 1,400 positive urine analysis after a traffic crash, okay? I don't call them accidents, they're crashes. There were 1,953 in the control population. These people were people that they randomly were then drug testing, probably weaving down the road, and so they tested their urine, okay? They're, and what they were doing was the exact same cutoff used by the U.S. Department of Transportation, okay? And so if there was any positivity for any other drug above 0.5 nanograms per ml in the urine or the blood, they excluded those patients. So they were solely looking at THC positive and positivity in the urine. Solely looking at THC patients. And what did they find? Um, they found an odds ratio of 10.8. The odds ratio would display the high association between the presence of urine, carboxy, THC, and traffic crashes with a p-value quite low, 0 0.0001. So urine tests can predict the risk of a crash versus just being impaired and weaving down the road. Again, the federal government has been urine using urine for a long time. Okay, so again, you may have been hearing about breathalyzers, concern I have about breathalyzers. I've heard from, from a CEO that's one of these companies up here is saying that, well, I could test for two hours since use. Is that long enough? What did the folks in Colorado say? Six or eight hours. Two hours I don't think is gonna be enough. 
So hopefully if we get a breathalyzer, I want it to be testing for longer than two hours since use, okay? Oral swabs or saliva tests, okay? Again, there's a couple of com companies out there, there's a few of them. You may have heard of these, Drager or Lair. Again, they're looking, um, depending on, on the company, some of them are looking at actual values, some of them are looking for positivity or negativity of these products. Again, it depends on which drugs, depending on the product that you're using, but there was a Salus case in Bakersfield, California, that actually helped them in the state of California to be able to use these swab tests and be able to bring them into court as evidence. Again, it's, it's being used as a screen to make sure to see if the person has been exposed to the drugs. <coughs> And so in this case, actually, it was methamphetamine as well as marijuana, as well as alcohol that the individual had consumed. And they were able to determine that because of the swab and they went back and got the blood test as well. Didn't say, look for methamphetamine, look for THC. So they knew what to look for, okay? Um, what's the validity of those oral swab testing? Again, blood and oral swab data from the 2013 National Road State Survey. There were over 4,000 in that study. 8.9 and 9.4 percent of the participants tested positive for THC in the oral fluid, also in the whole blood. The oral test then um, showed a sensitivity of 79.4 percent with a specificity of 98.3 uh, percent. And their the conclusions were the oral fluid test is highly valid method for detecting the presence of THC in the blood, but cannot be used accurately to measure the amount of, that's in the blood of blood THC. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at some of the data um, that, that's out there on these cra the crash information. Okay, so this is the, the uh, 2018 National Report from the Governor's Traffic Safety, uh, finding 44% of fatally injured drivers are known to be testing positive for drugs, which is up from 28% just 10 years ago. So we have a drug problem that's not alcohol. Again, we have books, we have things on the books about alcohol, but we don't have too, too many good things on the books about drugs, and that's what's climbing. Drug positive fatally injured drivers in 2016, 38% tested positive for some form of marijuana. 38% in 2016. 16% tested positive for opioids. So when people want to say we've got an opioid problem, is that in the driving? I would turn around and say, uh, no, 38% are testing positive for marijuana, 16% for opioids, 4% tested positive for both. Okay, here's some data that we're getting from the FARS database, and I'll tell about the, the, the issues with this database. Uh, later, you heard about some of it from, from uh, Lauren, but I'd like to point this out. This is data from 2015 and 16. We had uh, three legalized states back then. Um, with, uh, with, as the data was maturing, and we were seeing then an increase even from 15 to 16 in, in percent of cannabis, and these are fatally injured. This is the fatality analysis reporting system. Okay, so these are fatal cases. We saw it go from 22.2% in 2015 up to 28.4% in Colorado. So yes, it went up. Did alcohol go up? Yeah, just slightly, from 29 to 29.7. Okay, so what about Oregon? 14 up to 22. What about Washington? 23 up to 26. So we're seeing, as we're maturing in years in, in our, our recreational cannabis states, we're seeing an increase. That increase then overall is around 20% up to 25. All three states went up by 28%. And let's look at alcohol. Alcohol did go up, so I know that there were some concerns from folks about alcohol or there were some issues about, oh, maybe the alcohol use will go down. Well, that's not what we're seeing in our fatal cases. Okay, that actually went up just slightly, but not as high as marijuana or THC. Um, again, medical cannabis states have gone from 19.9 up to 24% in that one year, up 23%. Then no medical cannabis law state from 14 up to 15. So we're even seeing it in those as well for the overall in the United States going from 16% up to 18%, a total increase of 8.6% in that one year. Okay, this is speeding. And again, I warned you about speeding and using speeding as a measure in, in, in a study that people are being watched. Um, what they do here um, is the officers report the speed is like a black box in your car that they can go back and see how fast the car was going before the engine died. Okay, so if it's involved in a crash, they're gonna be able to know how fast that car was going and they'll be able to relate it to what the speed limit was in that area. So, this is what we looked at Washington. So again, this is data from the Barge database, 2015. We were looking at Washington drivers that were not speeding versus speeding. So 584 versus 200, total drivers of 788. The percent speeding was 25%. Okay, what about marijuana with no alcohol? Well, 41, 12, again, our numbers aren't big. We had a total number of drivers of 55, but we had a 47% rate of speeding seen in those fatal crashes with marijuana positivity, no alcohol. 
How about marijuana positivity and a 0.08 alcohol? Well, that was 18 were, were not speeding, 20 were speeding for a 52% rate. So when you combine the two, they're gonna speed even more than just marijuana alone. We also looked at, at blood alcohol 0.08 for all drivers and we saw 55% with alcohol alone. Okay, so again, all drivers around 26%, but then when you add, make it marijuana, 47. When you add the two together, 52, okay? So let's look at marijuana driving and fatal crashes speeding from 94 to 2004, nine and 14, okay? So we're looking at marijuana speeding cases. Again, the numbers were small back in 94. The numbers are maturing and getting a little bit larger because our percent of overall drivers with marijuana in their system went from 2.3% back in 94 to 7.9 to 11.9 to 15.3 in 2014. Okay, and again, this is even before we start uh, legalizing, we're already starting to see the increase as a, as a result of medical marijuana probably going on. Because we were having medical marijuana, we did not have recreational at that time. Another study that we were looking at using the FARS database was, what time of day is this happening? When is this happening? We know that alcohol tends to happen late at night, 10 p.m. to two in the morning. Sure enough, that's what, exactly what the data showed. The biggest, the four biggest times are 10, 10 to 11, 11 to, 11 to 12, you know, the death rates for alcohol are high from 10 p.m. to two in the morning, okay? What about for marijuana? Well, when we looked at marijuana, with no alcohol in it, we were seeing then the high points were occurring seven to eight in the morning, 104 deaths, from four to five, 89, from five to six, 98, from six to seven, 105, from seven to eight, 105. What is that? Peak driving time, before and after work, not in the middle of the evening, 10 to 2, 2 a.m. When you combined alcohol, we saw the, the peak started occurring two hours later. So we're thinking maybe they went to the bar for two hours consumed alcohol, so now it was marijuana plus alcohol, and we're seeing the peak happen two hours later. We did it in 2017, we saw, we found similar results, okay? 10, 10 o'clock, uh, 10 to 11, seven to eight, uh, 11, so we started seeing it happen a little bit later now in 2017, far as data. Again, we did see the exact same sort of time period late at night um, for alcohol positive alone. So again, marijuana fatalities are occurring after work, rush hour traffic, maximum traffic, alcohol fatalities are happening. It appears to be when the bars are closing late at night, okay? We did see the highest consecutive four uh, periods were from four to 9 p.m. 27% of the fatalities with marijuana positivity was, ha was happening during that time period, okay? Here's where we're looking day of the week, okay? So is there a difference in the day of the week? Well, with alcohol, we know people tend to party on the weekend. And sure enough, that's what we see. We see when we combine Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we come up with a total of 46%, uh, or sorry, for a DUI over here, actually, it's 61%. And during the weekdays, about 38% of the total fatalities. So the numbers, as you can see here, they're 400, 500, 600 from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, up to 700. But then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, they're in the thousands. Okay, so again, alcohol DUIs are occurring, fatalities are occurring on the weekends. Let's look at marijuana, 300, 343, 346, 340, okay? So a total of 49% were happening Monday through Thursday. What about the weekend? Well, they went up a little bit, but not too much, not too much. So this seems to be a daily event for marijuana, a weekend event for alcohol, okay? Increasing parts database, I don't know if people are aware of this. Um, there, was a, there was a study that was performed, came out in uh, 2017, that was looking at the FARS database for 25 years, from 1992 to 2016. They compared the fatal events on 420, I think we know what 420 is, and we kept it, they compared it to 413 versus 427. Okay, so a week before and a week after. Again, the reason why they're doing that, same time of year, same lighting outside, is there a difference? okay, on that day versus others. And when they looked at 420, yes, they did see an increase in fatality rate from 4, 420 p.m. to midnight on 420 by 12% that day. And I wanna warn you all, the day that it was equivalent to is Super Bowl Sunday. And Super Bowl Sunday, we see a 12% increase as well, typically from alcohol, on that day, okay? So be very careful on Super Bowl mm -hmm. Sunday, please, on Sunday.
Um, so we did see um, certain factors. There were factors increased risk was seen in uh, the younger age, again, less than 20, 20 uh, 30, 21 to 30. So again, the more uh, younger the users, we were seeing, we were seeing the issue in here. So let's kind of look at testing for alcohol and drugs in California. Okay, this is the 2016 database. And this is looking at then testing. What type of testing is going on? Looking for marijuana. Well, one of the things, again, your officers will tell you, and even your lawyers will tell you, well, if we get a positivity on alcohol, we kind of stop there. And they're not looking for the drugs. So we have a major problem even looking for drugs in the United States because this happens everywhere. So once they got that alcohol positivity, they're not looking for that concomitant use with other drugs. So our data is bad because they're not drawing blood or looking for drugs. They're looking first for alcohol. If they find it, sometimes a lot of places will stop because there's no added increase if you end up having marijuana and alcohol or marijuana, alcohol, and benzo. Some, there are some states that do kind of ratchet up the, the penalty, but most states do not, okay? And so what we're looking at, then what we're looking at in marijuana is, is uh, the, well, let's look at the drug group over here. So with 5,020 fatal cases in 2016, the amount that weren't tested, 4,000. Hmm. In the state of California, 25% testing for drugs in the state of California in fatal cases. And in some of these cases, the impaired driver, and again, they're looking at it for the impaired drivers on the table, right in front of the coroner. And when, when I've asked, why isn't that happening? Well, it costs money to run the drug test. Mm -hmm. I say, well, how much do you charge to perform the autopsy? I could tell you it's blood force trauma. We know what caused the death. I want to know what the substance was that caused that blood force trauma and ultimate death. But they're not doing it. Okay, now some of these, again, we're talking, we're talking the driver that was the at-fault risk driver is what we're talking about here, right? So some of them, it's not them. Okay, so no drugs were found in 605 of these thousand, so a positivity rate of about 40%. Okay, this is 2016 data. In California, 2016 again, so we had 1,000 usable. We had then a, a marijuana positivity in California of 197 out of the, the drug test with known drugs. That was now accounting for about 50% of them. Marijuana was positive. And of the total tested, it's about 19%. That's where I was telling you that 19%. So we're around 19% in the state of California back in 2016. The marijuana crash totals killed. Um, there were 240 and they broke it down and told us, okay, well, there were the driver, the impaired driver, that person was 125 times out of the 240. There were other people that were killed in these events. So there were 112 of those. And we call them innocents. These were the other drivers. These were the passengers. These were the pedestrians or bicyclists that were hit by the impaired driver. So that happens right here, 112 of those. So the percentage of this 240 deaths was 47% were the innocents. 53% was the impaired driver, 47%. And let's look at that as compared to DUI. The innocents being killed was actually 39%. Again, why did that happen? Go back to the time of day. How many pedestrians are out on the road? How many bicyclists are out on the road? How many other drivers are on the road? These people could be crashing into the tree themselves, right, and kill themselves, okay? So again, remember, that's why that time of day is so important. So again, let's look back. So uh, California uh, fatalities missed by not testing. Okay, so again, we, we, were, we were at 19%. And so we didn't test 4,000, the drivers weren't, weren't tested 4,000 times. So, well, this is something NHTSA uh, does with alcohol. What they tend to do is they'll take half of the percent and they'll multiply that then, half of that 27%, if 27% was the DUI rate, they're gonna take half of that value, okay? And they're gonna say, okay, well, this could, could have been how many more? So they're gonna say 13.5% times the number of not tested adds another 520 deaths for a total then of 875. Let's do that for marijuana. So now you have 4,000 that were not tested. So your rate was at 19.5%. If you take half of that or 9.1%, you're gonna add another 380 deaths for a total of 622 for the year. How about if you take a quarter of it? Just say, okay, maybe it's 4.6% times the number that weren't tested. That adds 197 more deaths 
or a total of 437 deaths. 437. In my books, that's more than one a day, because that's 365. So we suspect that there may be potentially a death a day in the state of California with a marijuana positive, but as a result of a marijuana positive driver. This is looking at the fatal crash of um, uh, uh, the marijuana positivity versus alcohol, DUI, over time. And this is looking at 2012, 15, 17, okay? So we pointed, we plotted those three, we drew a line through them, and as we're, what we're seeing here is the marijuana positivity is going up, the alcohol slightly coming down, and these two lines converge in the year 2021. This is national data, and we need to do something. Again, I'm not one to tend to throw the, the baby out with the bathwater here. Yes, I do agree there are flaws with the VARS database. Yes, I do, I do agree with the fact that there are differences across the states on how they test. There are inconsistencies. Who's tested? Differ by state. Many stop testing for drugs if alcohol is present. There's limited drugs. There are different cutoffs. There's different body fluids that they're testing. Absolutely. But do we throw out and ignore that data? The positives are there are trends and risk factors that can be seen. Age, time of day, potential agents. It is best that we, it's the best that we have for now. And my key question is, when are we gonna improve that? When are we gonna improve that VARS database? Let's get all states to be doing the same thing. Let's get all officers to be doing the same thing. Let's not be randomly deciding who we're gonna do drug tests on. Let's do it on everybody then. Because if you're randomly selecting, we're never gonna get a true picture on what the poly drug issue is. And we see the problem is poly drugs. What are costs to society? compared to marijuana taxation revenue. This is something I think people have missed. We're concerned about the taxes. In fact, I, I just saw an, an, somebody sent me something saying, we're talking about, we already talked about trying to get rid of the tax or drop it by 25% within three months of it starting. <laughs> and I think that's coming back again, that they're saying we're gonna drop the tax. Well, okay. So let's go ahead and look at the U.S. Department of Transportation came out with a study in 2010 that said there were about 33,000 fatalities. 3.9 million people were injured. 24 million vehicles uh, were damaged in the United States in 2010. And what they did was that that cost a total of $242 billion. And the breakdown as to where the costs came from are listed down here. And so essentially each fatality resulted in an average discounted lifetime cost of $1.4 million per driving fatality in the United States of America in 2010. Okay, with a 2 3% increase over time, now we're talking about, in 2018 dollars, probably closer to $1.6 million per death. Remember what I told you. One a day, 365 times 1.6. So let's take a look at our state tax that we've uh, picked up so far. And again, it's, it's not what the targets we're projecting. We have a cultivation tax in the first quarter in California was $1.6 million. Then it went up to $4.7 million. Then it went up to $12 million. Okay, and I have the references here where I'm getting this from. They actually send it to me. Here's the excise tax. Went 32, 42, 52 over the first, second, and third quarter. Okay, so that's increasing. That's increasing. What about the sales tax? 27 million, 33 million, 28 million. A 14% decrease. Yet our cultivation was up 2.5 fold. And our sales tax went down. Where did it go? So let's, let's come back. So a total then through the first three quarters is a total of 234 million. We took it in California with 273 deaths, or three quarters of the year, times $1.6 million. That's $436 million due to the driving fatalities alone, and yet we took in 234. So, just the driving fatalities alone, this 234 accounts for 53% of the driving fatality costs to society. So, bottom line. Law enforcement can detect marijuana presence. Standard field sobriety tests have been used for decades for alcohol to determine impairment. Okay, we've 
We've had legislatures pick this number of 0 0.08, but I've shown you the flaw in that, because what's that level when you start combining it with other drugs? It's not 0 0.08 anymore, okay? Per se, blood laws are ineffective for driving impairment. There's a poor correlation. There's inconsistent testing and time delays, as I, as I mentioned. The impaired drug levels are not the same. There are additive effects. There are synergistic effects that are occurring between these central nervous system depressants when combined. Again, THC content and then what's being sold, flour around 20%, concentrates around 75%, a maximum dose, as you just heard in the previous talk, 2,000 milligrams in the state of California can be sold. The FDA approved maximum is 10 milligrams of inevitable. It's well above what's being studied and, and tested. I encourage anybody that's out there doing impaired driving, uh, please let's use some reality. Let's not be using 6% or 12% THC. We have it in our state, you can go buy it. You're being funded by the state of California. You've been funded since the early 2000s to perform this work. You can use our local, in fact, it's now being regulated and tested, and we should be using those, those products. Simulating driving tests, again, I'd love to see them in, include distractions present like that's in the real world, the cell phone's going off, you've got the radio blaring. Let's start including all of these other factors that are going on in real life driving. We have to be measuring those chronic users. What a lot of these studies are doing is they're testing it in these infrequent users, as I showed you, okay? Because what we want to present, prevent is what happened. That school bus driver was clean. The guy in the white pickup truck was not. THC and clonazepam, a benzodiazepine, okay? Took out 12 kids on that bus, and a re, uh, an evaluation of this and came out with the results and recommendations in September of 2018. That event occurred in March of 2017 down in Texas, okay? Please don't drug, drug and drive. This is, we need to do something now. This is a public safety hazard. Please help me in trying to reverse this. This is why I gave today up from work and came here to talk to you. Thank you very much.